thank you, Martha, for that incredibly generous <laughs> introduction. And I also want to just take a brief moment to thank the Barnes Foundation um, and Alia Palumbo for making it possible for me to be here today uh, and to thank all of you for coming out on a beautiful Saturday morning uh, to hear me talk about what are going to be these very dark, brooding landscapes. <laughs> um, but I hope it'll be worth it. One of the things that was uh, difficult about putting together this presentation is that one, as an author, wants to sell the best bits of the book. But at the same time, uh, you don't want to give away all the secrets. Uh, and so in order to avoid being like a movie trailer that gives you the plot uh, so that you therefore don't have to watch the movie, I have made the decision that I will give, uh, with a handful of exceptions, images that are not in the book so that if you're excited about what you hear, you'll, you'll be even more anxious to get to the bookstore and buy it and see what's in there. Okay, oops, there we go. The other uh, feature of this lecture, which you might notice now with this Barnes image, is that any image that is highlighted in magenta is an image that is either at the Barnes, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, or in a local collection. So if you want to go see it in person, because for these particular types of works, it really uh, benefits to see them in person, you can uh, find them in local collections. So I begin with the Breton Spinner from 1867 in the Barnes collection, although not in the actual installation at the moment. To give you a sense of what Courbet was doing around 1867, this painting of a spinner uh, sitting in a landscape with a dog to the, her left and some sheep in a meadow in front of her was shown at a private exhibition that Courbet held outside the 1867 World's Fair. And it was in this exhibition that Courbet uh, showed that he wanted to posit himself as his own kind of institution or anti-institution anti to the state programs at the time. And he had actually already done that in 1855 in what was one of the gr first great gestures of modern art in its anti-institutional form by building another temporary exhibition outside the 1855 World's Fair which itself was France's response to the 1851 Crystal Palace exhibition. And this was at a time when these national world's fairs were really heating up uh, across the world. Now, if you had gone to this private pavilion, the Pavilion of Realism in 1855, one of the works that would have been literally in your face is the famous artist studio in which Courbet depicts himself flamboyantly painting a landscape with a nude contemporary model behind him, a child gazing innocently at what he is doing, and a cast of characters that included on his right many of his close friends and associates, all affiliated with the realist movement, and on the left, types and figures and characters that he liked to identify with, such as uh, beggars, for instance. But what is interesting for us today, besides the fact that this thing was very, very large and the figure is almost life size, is the central group where you have a very complicated and um, historically important moment when Courbet both declares his love for nature, but also shows that in doing so, he's turning his back towards 
genres like the nude uh, and academic figure painting. But of course, at the same time, he's showing that he's still very capable of doing it. So it's this very, very um, uh, deliberately conflicted image. But that image of him, not in front of a real landscape, but in front of a painted landscape, echoes what he'd like to publicize about himself because he himself was not from Paris, but from the Franche-Comté, which was one of the provinces. And in many ways, he liked to advertise that when he came to show his works in the capital. So just to give you an example of what he would say about his relationship to landscape, I wanted to show this quotation and, and read it right now, in which he says, quote, to paint the country, one must know it. I know my country, I paint it. These undergrowths, they're from home. This river, it's the Lou. That one, the Lison. These rocks, they're from Ornon and the Puy Noir. Go see them and you will recognize my paintings. So he very much wanted his self-identity to be wound up with his birthplace. And I'm showing on this map the region of eastern France where he was from, which was right next to the Swiss border. And in French history has an interesting development because, because it was so close to German-speaking lands and the Swiss border, it oftentimes would lean more east than west and often would find itself in conflict with its neighboring regions like Burgundy. And so when we speak about French national identity, the Franche-Comté both was and was not of France. And the people who lived there, particularly those who were against the national government, would often pride themselves on their independent streak. Now the landscape itself is a big limestone block that epochal erosion has uh, created several valleys and riverways. And sometimes these waterways go into the landscape through various grottos and come out elsewhere, um, sometimes as large uh, sources of rivers, but sometimes as more uh, uh, less spectacular. Um, sites. Courbet himself grew up in the town of Ornon, which was on the Loup River. And I'm showing you on the left here his uh, family house, which is now uh, the museum, uh, Museum Courbet. And he would paint there until about 1864. And then after that point, he actually moved to a studio outside of town where he could paint larger canvases more comfortably. And there he was very careful um, to get a plot of land that had both access to the river, but also to the landscape behind the studio so that he could actually get on his donkey and go to the sites that he painted uh, relatively easily. And even inside that studio, he actually decorated his uh, ceilings with landscapes. And so I'm showing you um, in the larger image um, a recently discovered fresco within that studio. Um, and that studio was recently bought by the, uh, the uh, local government and restored. So now if you go to Ornon, you can actually see the studio that for a long time, I believe was a, a car garage. Corbet painted landscapes throughout his career. Um, and already in the 1840s, he is creating very typical romantic painting where you have viewers in the landscape gazing out at, in this case, the sea, the Normandy coast, um, as a sign of the subjective experience you have as you walk through the landscape, as you travel through it. But as he developed into his more familiar realist vein, like the work on the right, which is in the Met of the women of the village, um, and these are actually his sisters, he was very careful to put 
that very distinguished cliff landscape of the Franche Comte in the background as the setting for these figures, which then, when they were shown in Paris, would definitely have stood out as being from that region. And that continues in the most famous canvases like the Braille d'Ornon, uh, where the background above the figures of the heads at the burial is, once again, one of those Franc-Contois cliffs. Um, and he even emphasizes the rockiness of the landscape by having the grave be right in the center of the painting in front of the viewer. Now, Courbet was not unique in painting landscape in the middle of the 19th century, but actually by then it was a very um, time-honored tradition. And here I'm showing you two uh, lesser known images of Courbet actually out in the landscape painting in the open air. He would often paint sketches and then bring them back to his studio to finish. Uh, the one on the left uh, is a painting by Corot, in fact, that they painted, he painted side by side with Courbet. And so Courbet is in the foreground of that image um, in the center painting under her umbrella. And I show you the detail of that in the bottom. And then the work on the right is by another artist on the Normandy coast where Courbet is painting uh, by the sea. So by this time, the image of the landscape painter as the person who re rejects drawing after the nude and academic procedures in the studio was already a cliche. Caricaturists like Honoré de Domier, uh, Honoré Domier uh, drew this particularly uh, humorous uh, image of Les Paysagistes, the landscape painters, Le Premier Copie La Nature, the first copies nature, Le Second Copie Le Premier, the second copies the first. And Courbet, of course, leaned into this idea that the rebellious artist must return to nature uh, in order to dispose of all convention when he painted this in a way, portrait of himself and his uh, patron, Alfred Brias, in which he has his easel and umbrella on his backpack out in the open sun in Montpellier. And then, of course, he also hired pho photographers to capture his image out in the landscape. Um, and this large photographic image is actually in front of that studio on the outskirts of Ornon. So what kind of landscape did Courbet paint? Well, forest, for one. On the left is often identified as the Forest de Barbizon outside of Paris, although, um, to my knowledge, that has never actually been conclusively proven. And then he also went on trips when he was not in Paris, uh, often during the summers. And the work on the right, which is an, a, an immense canvas in the Musée d'Orsay, is actually in Germany, in the, in the Black Forest, uh, where he painted these stags in, in kind of epic confrontation. But he also traveled to other parts of France, and this is from the region around Bordeaux, the Saintonge, and this was along one of the rivers in that part of France. And you can see that sometimes these landscapes seem to have been painted in preparation to add figures. Um, at least that's how this one always reads to me. And so that vast green expanse at the bottom right seems ready-made for an animal or some sort of figure for local character. And I, I mention that because if you look at the Barnes painting and think about it in terms of what he was doing in some of these Saintonge pictures, you can detect this idea of, of, of inserting a particular character with a, a certain local flair to uh, inhabit the landscape. So the work on the left is a Santonge landscape, and the work on the right is the Barnes painting, which assumedly is, is somewhere in Brittany. The figure of the rider on the donkey is something that Courbet actually would transpose into other landscapes. So one and a half years later, when he's back in the Franche-Comte painting, he would just take the same type of figure and put it on a bridge. Uh, so the work on the upper right, which is now in the Yale Art Gallery, 
is a Franck Comtois landscape with this one of these gushing sources, but he simply just juxtaposed or, or transferred over the, the figure on the donkey. So sometimes these landscapes aren't exactly you know, about one particular site, but sometimes he could mix motifs. Um, and sometimes if he didn't have uh, a particular figure, you know, he would go back to his previous works, like this dog from an early self-portrait added in into the Barnes painting. Now, it wasn't just inland scenes. When he went to the coast, the southern coast in the case on the left in Montpellier, and in the northern coast in near Trouville on the, on the right, he would paint some of the seemingly emptiest seascapes up until that point in art history. But from another point of view, they're also some of the fullest because the way that they're painted is so sensuous and organic that you almost feel the waves and the, the moisture-laden air as a kind of heaviness there on the canvas. And that is especially true in a later series of paintings of waves from 1869 when he was in Etretat. Um, the image on the right is very large and in Paris, and it's probably well known because it, but even by the 19th century, it was a, a postcard image. Uh, but the work on the left, which is in Philadelphia, uh, shows when clouds and waves become almost mirror images of each other. So with this general trajectory in mind, the various travels that he took, and the situation of landscape painting in the 19th century, I want to turn now to the question of, of technique, which is one of the other primary ways we have come to recognize Courbet as a, a great inventor in painting. And the tool for which he is most famous is the palette knife. And the palette knife, unlike the brush, is a tool that was used to mix paints on the palette and then either apply them in large swaths to, let's say, the background of a painting, um, or in selected details. And what's interesting about Courbet in the landscapes is that he often used the palette knife or brushes uh, that were used to look like uh, they were making palette knife marks throughout the entire painting, which gave them this physical presence that other paintings at the time did not have. And people often interpreted this as being a kind of crude workman, worker's painting and would depict Courbet, as in the caricature on the left, as someone who painted with a trowel, like a bricklayer. At other times, the thickness of the painting was related more to foodstuff. And so the knife wasn't a trowel, but a, a pastry chef's knife loaded with cream. And so the work on the right is a caricature of one of his waves as a painting of, of, of cream. And this went hand in hand in, in, with some of his other um, famous images uh, in which he is often depicted as a very bloated, um, gluttonous person uh, who liked to drink beer and eat and laugh and have a good time but also someone who was interested in manual labor and the working class. So those images of excess, but also of um, class identity are both folded into his image of an artist who uses the palette knife. To put this into context, I think it helps to look at what the other major schools of landscape painting were at the time and how they treated texture and uh, technique, because I think it puts the, the palette knife use into uh, greater relief. So probably the most dominant school at the time was that of historical landscape painting, which was called as such because it harkened back to the Italian countryside when French painters for centuries would go to hone their trade and then come back to Paris uh, and show at the Salon. And that type of painting usually imitated 17th century French and Italian painters who liked panoramic views um, with a lot of, of blue, blues and greens, and typically in very idyllic um, scenarios or those based on mythological subjects. Now at times, especially in the work of Corot, 
Camille Corot. The work could have a kind of sketchiness and uh, freedom of execution that sometimes has parallels with Courbet's painting. In fact, Corot and Courbet painted side by side in 1862, and so they would have been quite familiar with, with each other's working technique. But inevitably, when those works were shown at the Salon, they were much more finished, and a lot of the roughness or uh, gestural expression was, was lost. Such was not the case in many of the painters of the English school, like John Constable. The work in Philadelphia uh, is one of the, what are called six footers, which are very, very large paintings at the scale of painting for the public exhibition, but done in the style and execution of a, a rougher sketch. And Constable actually painted them at the same time, and unlike other painters, was not magnifying a smaller sketch to a larger painting. And so there's a, a collapse between study and finished work that begins to occur in his works. But perhaps the most immediate model for Courbet's landscape painting was the Barbizon School, so-called because many of these artists, like Jean-Francois Millet and Théodore Rousseau, spent part, if not all, of their lives in the village of Barbizon in the Fontainebleau Forest. So, in a way, this was a kind of compromised position. It was a landscape outside of Paris, but not so far that you had to take a train or uh, a day's carriage ride to get there. It was just outside the city. And it is really there that uh, many of the more inventive landscape techniques were happening. So uh, in the Millet in Philadelphia on the right, you have this quite amazing electrification of the forest uh, using uh, firelight to animate the landscape. And so rather than the trees and the, the ground being the most solid parts, it's actually the light of this uh, fire that is the most solid part of the painting. And it's really in Théodore Rousseau that you have the, the craziest and wildest uh, exploration of technique. So in this view of Mont Blanc um, in Switzerland, you have everything from a very opaque uh, treatment of the snow to a very washy representation of the foreground. So the snow is on, on the right, on Mont Blanc, and the thinness where you can even see some of the drawing of the preliminary stages uh, is in the detail on the left. Mm. But despite all those moments of experimentation in the landscape of Courbet's immediate predecessors, there is really nothing like the palette knife painting that he practices. And that's because instead of going for the sweeping gesture or the um, kind of evocation of romantic wildness, his paintings, when he uses the palette knife, tend to be very impacted and, and dense and almost still in a way. And because he uses the knife, there are no traces of brush hairs that signal the artist's uh, hand movements. But instead, you have this very uh, patch-like application of paint that is built up in layers. But surprisingly, given the caricatures, those layers aren't incredibly thick and, and bulging off the canvas. In fact, there tend to be no more than three, yet they give the illusion of, of a surface relief that one had never seen before. And so this effect actually interested me quite a great deal when I was writing the book, because I was trying to figure out why, after all these years of being taught that Courbet painted like a bricklayer, that actually his landscapes were not that thick, yet appeared to be so. And as I began to look at more of his paintings, I, I did what I think many of us do, which is try to get closer to the canvas to figure out how he made it. And what's interesting about Courbet's landscapes is that as you get closer to them and expect the illusion to collapse into pure paint, that actually doesn't happen right away. As you move closer, you see more paint layers, but because the landscape itself is very humidified and organic and paint-like, you see all those paint strokes as just another layer of the landscape that is 
being revealed to you as you move closer into that dark uh, core of the cave. And this happens, I would argue, even as you get very, very close. Yes, it's paint, but it also appears like it could be the, the wet surface of a rock. Now, eventually, of course, you do see it as paint, but compared to all other painters before him, that moment of the collapse of the illusion takes a very, very long time, which is why they have such a magnetic attraction to the viewer. Uh, it, the viewer wants to know more and more, and yet is not given the, the answer. And I think Courbet was actually going for that effect in these landscapes. And in particular, in the paintings of grottos that he does at a very, very specific point in his career, which is in 1864. And it, it is such an unusual and ins motif for the time, yet so insistent in his work that as I began to research it, that there had to be a reason for this. Because Courbet did not have to paint those grottos. He could have painted the buildings around them or down the river from them. And these are both images from the 19th century that show the entire complex of mills and foundries that were around these water sources, which were a source of power uh, until you had um, you know, more industrial forms of, of power. But he also didn't paint at this time with the same insistence all the views from the plateaus above those river valleys, which he easily could have and did earlier in his career. And he didn't even paint the views that were down in the river that much either. But what he did paint beside those grottos were these shaded streams and kind of covered uh, riverbeds that look as if no one had set foot in them before, as if you were in some sort of primordial universe that you just discovered. And unlike some of those grotto paintings, these were not tourist sites. Uh, this site called the Puy Noir, or the Black Well, was the one mentioned in that quote I read earlier. And this was one of those sites that Courbet would visit on his donkey from his studio and was really unique to him. Yet he painted it over and over again in many different formats and from many different points of view. And what is striking about them, and I'm showing you a, a particularly um, beautiful one in, in Baltimore, is that they have an almost proto cezannean uh, display of the manufacture of paint from basic touches to build the illusion of form. In this particular image, I think the green uh, patch of light in the center is probably the most striking aspect because uh, even though it's in the background, because it's so bright, it tends to leap forward, which is something you often see in uh, brushstrokes in Cezanne, where something seems to be part of the background, but actually comes forward because it, it's so large and because of it, the way it's colored. And when you have a landscape organized in this way with no point of access or easy egress, and when you have no sky to provide a, an outlet for vision, you, you are kind of stuck there. And the only thing you have to look at really are the forms emerging from the darkness. And that kind of temporality the, of this slow illumination is very different from the kind of uh, viewing time when your eye goes from point A to point B in a landscape and follows a trail. Here, the trail, if there is one, is frozen, is stopped at the river. This is the photograph of the interior of the studio that I had showed earlier back in the 19th century. In fact, the very same year that he's painting these grottos and streams. And on the back wall, the, the very large one uh, slightly to the left uh, was one of these Puy Noir that he painted in 1864. And so you can see that every day that Courbet was working, he had these big landscapes uh, all around him. And so it, it makes sense that he would be particularly focused on this type of image. The one thing I, I forgot to mention is that in the previous decade, in the 1850s, and even the early 1860s, Courbet traveled pretty much every summer. But in 1864, he stayed in the Franche-Comte for about a year and a half without really moving. 
for the first time in, in years. So he really had the time and the interest in really depicting in a new way his local landscape. Now, I want to uh, move in this part of the talk to two particular landscapes that he paints at this time that reflect some of his interest in this moment of 1864, where he's looking at the landscapes of his region in a new way. That is, he's engaging with the research and activities of his friends who weren't necessarily painters um, and who weren't necessarily even writing about or studying landscape. Uh, a group of writers, scientists, all of whom were in that region and sometimes in the very same town that Corbet was staying in. The work on the left is a waterfall called the Gour de Conche, which means a gulf of the shells, like a conch shell. And that's because the river that feeds this waterfall was lined with which shell shapes. Um, and it had a particular resonance for Courbet at the time, which has really been lost now, but which in the course of my research was very interesting to uncover. One of the things I, I want to mention before going into this story, however, is just to give you a little feel for what it's like to go to these landscapes. The Gour de Conche, like the Puy Noir, is not one of the, the must-see sites in the Franche-Comté. Uh, in fact, if you try to find it, there's a sign but no parking lot. So you have to park on the side of the street and then walk about a quarter of a mile with no indication about where you're going. And you more or less stumble across it. And from when I was coming, I was coming from where the bridge is on the upper part of the canvas, but to get down there, there's no path or step case uh, or staircase. You actually have to grip onto this rope that has been attached to, to tree trunks and, and kind of amble way, your way down. Um, and I actually fell <laughs> coming down that, but luckily it had snowed and there were a lot of leaves, so that broke my fall. Because in the age before cell phones, if I had broken my back, I would have been stuck in the middle of nowhere uh, all in, in pursuit of Corbet research, which it sounds, it sounds very um, uh, committed to, my, to the cause, but I must say it could have turned out much differently. Now, like many of the other landscapes, when you try to actually photograph the landscape in person, you realize that Corbet pushed the landscape much closer to the viewer than it actually exists in reality. So I was trying to stand where the, the top edge of the rocks would be more or less where the painting is, which I tried to do on the right. And you see that the waterfall is way back in the background. So Courbet has actually pushed it up because he wants the water and the rock face to be literally in your face. When you try to approximate the um, size of the waterfall, for instance, you have to actually have to get very, very close to it. Um, and so the image on the right is, was my attempt to, to get to the position where I feel that it's just as close as it is in the painting. And it, it is way closer than uh, from the far view. You can also add to that that in order to stand where Courbet situated the viewer, you actually had to be in the middle of the river. So the work on the left is facing the waterfall. The, work, uh, the image on the right is me turning around 360 degrees to show what was behind me. And you see I'm smack in the middle of the river. So Courbet in these paintings is putting you in situations that you don't experience really unless you kind of do these mental contortions. But the effect is one of being smack in the middle of a landscape. So he's, he's being both true to nature, but almost going beyond it by emphasizing its physical sensuality. So why did he paint this waterfall at all? Well, in his group of friends around that time, uh, many of them were interested in 
what was called the Battle of Avija. Now, those of you who know a little bit about French history uh, might recognize that name because Alija is the battle where Julius Caesar defeated the Gallic general Vercingetorix and essentially established France as an extension of the Roman Empire. So historically, that was the battle where France became part of the Latinate uh, sphere of orbit of classical antiquity rather than the Celtic one. And so that was around 52 BCE. It's one of those founding myths along with Joan of Arc that French people in the 19th century used as um, a way of establishing their, the origins of their national identity. So it was really, really important to know where that battle happened. The location of Elysia was still hotly debated well into the 19th century. And one of the candidates was a town not too far from Corbeil's hometown of Ornon, less than a day's travel. And that town was called Alès. The other candidate was in Burgundy and was called Alize. Now, in order to determine the identity, these towns and regions actually hired scholars, uh, military planners, and what was becoming the field of archaeology, sending archaeologists to mine the landscapes to find weapons, um, the traces of paths, the names of towns that matched Caesar's writings in the Gallic Wars. So it became this incredible intellectual enterprise. And the emperor himself, Napoleon III, who was writing a biography of Julius Caesar at the time, of course really wanted to know where it actually happened so he could talk about it in his book. In this map, which is a 19th century map, um, the town of Alès is, is circled. And that, that wasn't me putting those circles in there. That was actually from a magazine called The Military Spectator. And that was where they hypothesized that the, the siege of Elysia took place. And those were Caesar's um, lines that he used to encircle the Gallic camp. And it was in one of those rings that the waterfall was located. And in Caesar's Gallic Wars, he talks about filling one of the, uh, the ditches that they dug with water from one of the local waterfalls. And so Corbe's friends, who brought him to the Gour de Conche, explained to him that actually the Gour de Conche was one of the waterfalls used to fill the trenches. So it actually had a historical importance, even though when you look at the painting, it doesn't seem like it. The idea was that something seemingly as insignificant or, or minor as a, a certain part of the landscape, if you began to look at it in its full historical context, would reveal this hidden history that was not available by simply reading books or looking at maps. You had to actually be in the landscape to compare it to the text and to do excavations in the field in order to mine or unearth this history. And the, the town of Salin, um, which is at the bottom left, will, will come up a little bit later. And the source of the Lison, which is very, very close, was also one of these caverns and grottos that Corbet painted. Now, this idea that digging up the past, unearthing the landscape, might reveal a counter history was particularly relevant in Corbet's time because Napoleon III eventually sided with Alize as the site of Elysia and not Alès in the Franche Comte. And he actually wanted to monumentalize that, so he commissioned this very, very large statue of Versailles-Jectorix and had it installed in Burgundy. So Corbet, uh, being the good Francois that he was, actually painted a painting called the Oak of Flagé. Flagé was the plateau where his family had farmlands. And actually when he exhibited this in 1867 at the same pavilion that he showed the Barnes painting, he actually referred to it as the Oak of Versailles-Jectorix on um, facing the camp of Caesar. So 
by naming the painting after the event um, involved with Alija, he was implicitly declaring that he thought that Alez uh, was Alija, and that therefore the official history put forward by the emperor was wrong. Now, another aspect of this battle of Alija, both the historical one, but also the battle in the 19th century to determine its location, also involved the study of language. After all, the texts were all in Latin, and the place names were all either in French or in the local uh, dialect or patois. And this is a uh, cartoon from the period that it actually is uh, now housed in the Museum of Archaeology in Saint-Germain-en-Laye. And that museum actually was founded from the excavations that took place in Alize. So it's very interesting that the, they kept that as a record. And the, it's pasted onto this album that you see on the right. But the, the cartoon itself reads, Transcendental, uh, Transcendental Archaeology, what are these men thinking about? And it says, some think ali, alez at their leisure, the others think about Lees. The others think about Lee, this woman named Lees. So it's a little lost in the English translation, but they're clearly playing on the idea that Alez and Alees are very close phonetically, that by one vowel is the separation between the, the name of the two towns. Now, why does that matter? Because in trying to prove one way or the other which town was Alija, they had to go back to things like these inscriptions that they would find. Um, and this particular one has the, the name of Alija in um, classical language, which I highlight in yellow, where the vowel is spelled with an I. And so there was a big debate, which uh, I don't have to go into here because it would take forever, but uh, to determine, did the I become an E or did it be, stay as an I? Uh, or did the I become an AI or did it become an I as in Alize? So did it become Alez or did it become Alize? And so in order to answer that question, you had to study the history of the French language to figure out how vowels changed. And that was actually one of the major goals of one of Courbet's friends, a, a man named Max Bouchon, who actually took it upon himself to write a whole series of texts and books that collected patois songs, folk sayings, and place names to try to establish a history of popular language that was centered on the Franche Comte. And clearly all these investigations of language and in general uh, interest in provincial culture fueled uh, his research into the local language. The main inspiration in fact was a a book by one of Courbet's early critics named Jean Fleury, uh, in which he collected popular songs from the provinces of France. And in fact, in the Franche Comte section of that book, Courbet did one of the illustrations, which I'm, I'm showing on the right. And in fact, Jean Fleury must have interviewed Courbet because he mentions songs that Courbet's sisters used to sing, and also illustrated, uh, well, referred to one of Max Bouchon's um, songs that he included in one of his short stories, and actually even included the music in the, the book. Now, Bouchon uh, himself was also interested in landscape, not as a, a geologist or a um, painter, but he actually owned one of Courbet's paintings of the source of the Lison River, which is that source um, that was near Salin and Alès. And these are two different versions. Um, we don't know which one he owned, uh, my guess is the smaller one, but that's still to be proven. And this shows clearly that Bouchon was in close dialogue with Courbet. In fact, Courbet was living in Salin, where Bouchon was, for three months at the end of 1864. Now, there actually was a geologist who was in this group, a man named Jules Marcoux, and He's actually depicted in this painting, although you don't see him at first, but he's that black figure right of center at the bottom. Um, hopefully you can all see them. You can, it's kind of easy to see his two legs against the green at the bottom. 
So he's there sketching the landscape. And, and why is he doing that? Well, because that rock behind him overlooked Salam and was one of the objects of his researches. Here's the rock uh, in a photograph. Um, like with many of the landscapes, it's actually hard to get the point of view in the painting. So in order to do this, because I wanted you to see the strata, I actually had to kind of climb up the uh, cliff a little bit and do it from the top going down. The strata were very important because as a geologist, that's what Marcou was interested in. And Bouchon was fascinated by this and actually wrote a biography of Marcou because he felt that this new science of geology or relatively new science of geology was revealing layers of earth history that let's say the biblical creation story of the earth's creation did not reveal. You know, if, if God made the earth, then it couldn't be that old. But these strata showed that there were layers of history that dated the origins of the earth way, way, way back into deep time. And that was really a new kind of historical consciousness for the 19th century. And here, here's Mark Wu, who actually was working in the US uh, after 1848 and went on many of the expeditions to the American West um, that people like Timothy O'Sullivan went on. But by the 1860s, he wanted to raise his children in France, so he moved back to his native town of Salin. And there is when he reconnected with Bouchon and where Bouchon began to ask him about all these new discoveries. And Marcou, besides doing this research into the local landscape, he's actually probably most known because he's the one who coined the term Jurassic period for that particular moment in Earth history, from which comes, of course, Jurassic Park and all these other um, uh, dinosaur-affiliated terms. So when you look back at these grottos, given this deep interest in origins on the part of geologists, linguists, um, and writers, you see that Courbet's depictions of the source are not simply replicating uh, tourist images. Um, they are also committed to their own kind of visual archaeology, where you peel back the layers of the landscape to discover its earlier states of creation and moments of creation that go back into the deep past. That, I think, explains why he painted those paintings so that you keep feeling like you're going further and further into the landscape and visually peeling back layers of history because he wanted to create as art or in art the distended temporality of this long, historical consciousness. Now, the artist who understood that the most was Cezanne, who is said to have said in front of this painting, one of the great waves from 1869, that the wave strikes you in the face, and I'm quoting him here, and you feel like it's coming at you from the depth of ages. So Cezanne, more than anyone else, understood both the physical presence and, and force of Courbet's painting, but also this sense that the painting is creating a different kind of temporal experience, one that is more akin to a geological ex, you know, ex, um, excavation or a, a historical investigation. In other words, it's not about the superficial image that nature or the landscape gives you, but the process that it requires you as the viewer to undergo to uncover layers of history. And since I don't want to uh, leave you with such a foreboding and, and overwhelming image, I, I will just leave you with this much brighter Trouville painting because the idea that nature or landscape, or painting for that matter, has a, a density that needs to be unpacked and unmined in order for the viewer to uh, experience its full 
force, well, that's something that happens in a much more cal uh, in a calmer and more muted fashion in these seascapes where matter is thrust upon you, uh, but also at the same time in a very expanded and infinite sense. So the interesting thing about these seascapes from the 1865 onward is that they give you both a feeling of deep time but also immediacy of focusing on a particular area of water but also of a whole, of looking at the ground beneath your feet but also the clouds up in the far distance. So it gives you this kind of almost universal sense of bathing in matter that is the next evolution in what Courbet is doing in landscape painting. But in order to do that, you're going to have to read the book, uh, <laughs> which also concludes, I must say, with Cezanne. So there, there's much more to read, but I, I thank you for being patient and listening to uh, just these little um, hors d'oeuvres. Uh, and yeah, I will conclude there. Sure, sure. So, um, thank you. That was beautiful. Um, we are supposed to use this uh, orange, thank you, orange microphone so that people at home can, so that people at home can hear. Uh, so, I'll start right here. And I, this is meant to be thrown, so I'm going to toss it. Okay. Hi there. Hi. Um, in the 1850s, 1860s, there was an explosion of French landscape photography, and mm. Courbet would have been working in the Barbizon right next to photographers that were working. Was there a, a particular influence, or how did he how did he relate to photography? Mm -hmm. How did it? Yeah, no, no, that's a, that's a great question. Um, in fact. It is often argued that many of those wave paintings have an almost photographic stillness to them, uh, in that the way they, they seem to freeze motion. Uh, the 20th century German critic Walter Benjamin actually said that they prefigured in their snapshot uh, sensibility later ph photographic techniques. Uh, there's a, a couple ways to, to look at it, that is the relationship between painting and photography in Courbet. As you mentioned, there was indeed a, a real explosion of landscape photography around mid-century. Uh, you, you, many, in fact, of those early photographers were painters themselves. Uh, and there, there was no escaping that. Uh, it was, in a way, the translation of landscape sketching and, and paint, kind of Sunday painting into a, a new technological medium. Courbet himself uh, had a, I think, a much more uh, utilitarian uh, approach to photography in that he liked to use it to record his paintings, and he liked to, if he didn't have a model available, receive photographs, let's say portraits, that he could then copy and put into his paintings. But if you look at the photographic views of the sites he painted, uh, they, first of all, they're much later, but also they don't um, have the same framing and they certainly don't have the same materiality, which is the, the big, big difference. Um, so I would say that although in Barbizon painting and photography, you do have sometimes in the tonal variation a, something comparable in painting and photography, I think with Courbet, the, the use of the palette knife and the, the way of layering the paint uh, is the main concern. And so, uh, in a way, I think photography is not a model for him in, in the landscapes that I was just talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that if he, let's say, became a slave to the model um, or even just used it, you wouldn't have all these features like changing the landscape so that it feels closer or having certain parts of it be very tactile. Um, they would have all seemed very distant. And in fact, uh, there's a photographer named Gustave Le Grey who also did a lot of waves. And his waves are always 
you know, perfectly in the distance. They're never in your face. So uh, I think that in a way it, they were their antitheses. Uh, there's a question back here, then I'll, I'll get you up here. Also, um, people at home, uh, I've got the chat here, so please type your type your questions into the chat, and I will read them. Nina, <laughs> hi. Thank you so much for a fantastic lecture and a fantastic approach to Kube. Um, I, I was wondering, because I've been working on Cezanne, um, or I have worked on Cezanne, um, and Cezanne's own interest in geological and petrological landscapes of his own country, of his own region, Provence. And um, I had put a kind of uh, ethnic, nationalistic, and regionalist twist to that. And I noticed that perhaps, you know, with people like Marcou, uh, you also add something like that to Courbet's work. And here is the gist of my question. I noticed also that he paints in Normandy, which was one of the hub of uh, geological and paleontological research in the 19th century and that he records the very picturesque, is it the Porte d'Aval or the Porte d'Amont? I always confuse yeah. them. Right, um, uh, a standard image of uh, touristic postcards to begin with. But also for those who were interested in geology, a, a, a major document of um, the passage of time or deep time, if you want, it was uh, limestone, it was, uh, you know, manifestly stratigraphic, and then it also was full of fossils. Mm -hmm. And um, about the same time, Monet is, paint is painting this, it actually marks all the layers, the stratigraphic right. layers. Um, and so I was wondering <laughs> here that if Courbet had that interest developed already when he visited Normandy and just bypassed the geological detail for Normandy, but stressed it when he was in his own region um, for reasons of local regionalist, I don't know, loyalty. Sorry, I'm just pulling up the... Yeah, the he, here I can, see, I can see the layers. Oops. Are you familiar with the Monet stratigraphic yes, yes, yes. rock? Yeah, that's what's on my mind. And I think it dates of 1866 or 68 for, for the Monet. Mm, yeah. Uh, so first of all, I, I, I must say I, I want to thank Nina for actually being one of the pioneers in this analysis of, of 19th century painting and geology. Her, her book on Cezanne is, is wonderful if you want to read even more <laughs> than Courbet. And yes, I think the, the, the contrast you're pointing out between when Courbet painted in the Franche-Comté and when he painted in Normandy is very pertinent because I agree with what you said that when he's in the orbit of Marcoux, the, the interest really is in, in the, the specificness of the local landscape and especially the geological aspect. Um, in the book, I go into which particular geologist, uh, which is Alexander Bonnard, that Marcoux is actually paying homage to here because he actually writes about this rock with explicit reference to Bonnard, who was one of the pioneers of stratigraphy in, in 19th century French science. But when he goes to Normandy, uh, uh, Courbet was one of these people who was very, very open to whatever happened to be in the air around him. And in addition to being a, a center of geological uh, investigation, it was also the kind of explosion of modern tourism because Normandy was now w one hour away from Paris by train with the new train lines. And when you read his letters, uh, when he's in Normandy, he talks as much, if not more, about the social life, the casinos, and the, 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 um, the demi-monde 
and the, the Parisians who are there at the shore than he really does about um, uh, geology, <laughs> let's say. And when he goes to Etretat, um, he actually shows the Etretat, the Porte d'Aval, at the Salon of 1870, paired with one of the wave paintings. So, not this particular wave painting, but actually an even bigger one. And I think that is a summary of his two approaches to landscape painting in the late 1860s. So around 1869, 1870, you have the tourist image and you have the, the kind of threatening visceral wave. And those are the two poles of his landscape painting. And he is interesting precisely because he can do both at the same time and, and does so. Uh, and in many ways, that's like his persona in general. He had his social, um, have, kind of heavily invested in the, the art scene side, and then he had this uh, almost kind of phenomenological, um, intensely personal and almost somatic experience of the landscape side. And sometimes they come together and sometimes they remain apart. And I think with the Etretat painting, they, they, they're apart. But of course, Monet, as you correctly point out, uh, clearly tried to fuse them together. Uh, and which is why that, that painting is, is particularly interesting. Thank you. Hi, my question is really about these subjects which are so tumultuous, uh, certainly the waves and the um, waterfalls. They're not restful images. Um, was there, are they in some way metaphors for something in his personal background or even politically that he's um, referencing that we could you know, mm. Do you mean the, the waterfalls and, and the one and, that you just showed with all the rocks coming up and it feels very much like things are in turmoil. Mm. So I'm just mm. wondering if there's any kind of anything we can read into that. Mm. Um, I, I would stick with what I was saying earlier and that the the political reference has to do with where it was located. Um, and how it was painted, actually, if you look at romantic images of similar types of motifs earlier in the century, they actually tend to be even more agitated, where the, 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 the romantic sublime takes over and the, the waves and usually lightning and some sort of storm, that is even more agitated. So actually, historically speaking, they actually are relatively, calm might not be the right word, but kind of brooding and, and um, they kind of sneak up on you rather than kind of being a, a flash of lightning. Um, at least that's how I experience them. And so, yes, in the case of the waterfall, I think it has to do specifically with that milieu, intellectual milieu he's around. The wave um, has been interpreted sometimes as a kind of uh, commentary on the political situation at the time in the sense that this was right before um, the commune um, around the time of the Franco-Prussian War and that there was a kind of general uh, malaise or uh, ill at ease in, this, in the air. Um, I, I have a different interpretation, but it, it has been read that way. Paul, I have a, a, about a million questions for you, but I just, I'm just going to ask one. Um, would you mind pulling up one of the grotto, uh, maybe the one that you, where you zoomed in on the, on the um, paint of the rocks. Yeah, that's great. Uh, uh, the earlier? last one. Yeah, that. Um, I mean, thank you so much for this talk. It was fascinating, and the the history of the the, the debate over the origins of Elysia was so interesting. Um, I my question is about these, um, and I loved your discussion of. What, like what happens when you get closer in and how you know it doesn't just sort of di dissolve into into just pure paint but the, 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 the there's this persistence of the kind of rock right I think my, my question then is about the, the darkness at the at the center um, and the role of that in these works uh, because it's it's really, I don't know, sort of hard to look at. I found myself 
I mean, I love these paintings, but they, they, it really has such a psychological effect. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, and maybe it's not this, I think it's different when you're looking at a, a, a grotto like this in person. Um, but when it's in the center of a painting and you expect to be able to see, if a if painting is about seeing, right? And at the, at the very center, there is this whole area that you, that you just can't see. Um, I, so my question for you is about what is, what is the role of this sort of absence at the, at the mm -hmm. heart of these paintings? No, that's a great question because I agree, they're very unsettling. Um, the, the, these images on the screen don't do them justice. They, they are mostly over a meter wide or tall. And I want to emphasize, which I do this in the book, but didn't do so much here, that it is incredibly rare in the history of European painting to have the center of the painting be a black hole. Um, if you look at most paintings, there's usually something in the center or at least something to fill the space. And so to ask the viewer to look at nothing and yet have it be almost eating you up, you know, kind of surrounding you, is a very uncomfortable experience. But I think that's the point, because it's the only way that you're going to get the viewer to kind of get past the instinctual kind of distance that you put your, between yourself and an image to, to kind of get closer to the painting. Um, and I'm sure probably, maybe not at the barns because you can actually get pretty close to the paintings here, but if you go to some of the bigger museums, the, the paintings are hung higher and the rooms are bigger, so you, you tend not to get close to them. But these paintings you know, entice you in, um, however creepy they may be. And that's, I think, unique to Courbet and particularly to these grotto paintings. The other thing I want to say is that the ground here, that dark ground, is, is not viewed when you're up close to it as you know, some sort of you know, uh, non-treated surface that the, the paint sits on top of. They're almost like a matrix of origination where because he uses a lot of translucent paint, even kind of in the darker areas, you still want to examine them because there's probably going to be more there if you just get closer and, and, and look at them. So that's a very different conception of the ground than to the blank canvas. Um, you know, it's not like in Cezanne where you have exposed ground and then paint. There's actually an incredibly um, kind of bodily experience of uh, layers of substance as you get closer to them. Yeah, so I think that's a, it's a really good point to point out how unusual that is, yeah. Um, thank you, okay. Another question? Sorry, this one will be quick. Um, I just loved that you included photos of um, the actual locations. We were sort of traveling to place with you and traveling you as you traveled, um, you know, after that viewpoint. So um, I, I'd love if you could elaborate a bit on the importance of going to the places that were in the paintings and mm. how that sort of helped you think through your arguments of time and place and um, you know how landscape experiences time may be different than us and how that's a link to the past and anything mm. um, on that. And thank you so much. No, thanks. It, it's, it was actually really fun to, to bring out those photos again because uh, you know once you go, you have it in your memory and I, I, I don't reproduce them in the book. Um, but I think it helps to tell the story because in a way you're, you're putting yourself in the painter's shoes. And in this, the particular case of Courbet in his native region, I think it is important because you realize, uh, one, how much he changed what he saw, but also how close everything was in a 19th century sense. I mean, I was there driving my rental car everywhere, but if you imagine, okay, this was a, a, a carriage or a horse, it, it was still pretty close by for the time. And so the, these are sites that are close to each other, but also he didn't paint all the sites in between. You know, he didn't paint the plateaus, he didn't paint the, the, so much the river towns. And so you, you get a kind of um, sense of the selectivity. Um, and one of the reasons actually I don't talk about it in the book so much is that there is a certain, how would you put it, uh, way of doing, 
uh, scholarship on landscape painting where identifying the site is almost treated as the be all and end all. You know, you explain the painting if you find the site. It's kind of iconography, but for landscape. And I didn't want that to be the main point, the main thrust of my book, and so I didn't put it in there. Um, it's a means to an end. Um, and it just happens to be very productive in Courbet's case. But there's other artists, you know, you probably wouldn't learn so much about them if you saw, um, you know, the part of Fontainebleau Forest that everyone else painted, because probably they painted it because everyone else painted, like in that caricature, rather than having any kind of deep, almost scientific interest in it the way Courbet did at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we should, we should wrap up. Um, I will just read you um, a comment from the chat. Thank you for a fascinating talk. I will see Courbet's work very differently now. Um, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you.